we can be going to Romans 3 and we're going to cover four verses today. Romans 3, verse 27 through 30. As the Lord mentioned, if you have a godly father or grandfather, thank the Lord for that. One example that I always, always liked a lot was uh, Arthur Pink's father. You know, you know, they all like know that I like Arthur Pink and his writing. He grew up in a, a Christian home, but at an early age he went into following a cult religion rather than hmm. being saved and yet his dad was faithful to wish him good night and recite some scripture to him. Yeah. Now, after years of doing that, one day the scripture was, there was a way which seemed was right unto a man, but in there over the ways of death. And the Lord began to convict him and he stayed in his room for three days, hmm. burdened by that. Hmm. And the Lord used that to save his soul. Amen. His last uh, message to his fellow cult people was a, to preach the gospel to them. Amen. So, don't be discouraged if you don't see your children believing when you'd like them to. But the Lord can use even the littlest of influence to burn their hearts and save their souls. Amen. Let's go to Romans 3, verses 27 through 30 here. You know, after we have seen that God is the one that justifies us, that because of his righteousness and it's through the shed blood of Christ, even though we are depraved sinners by nature, yet after we've seen all this and we see that inside of us, he poses this question in verse 27. He says, where is boasting then? What room do we have for, for boasting? When we consider that God is the one who's done all the work in our salvation, that it was really, going back to the previous verse, we see that it was God that justified us. It was according to his righteousness that he was both just and the justifier of them that believe, he says. And if we go back farther, we see that it was through faith in the blood of Christ that we have remission of sins. We be mad. Go back <coughs> there and we see that it was by His grace that we were freely justified and have redemption in Christ. And we go all the way back further in the chapter, we see how that we are all guilty before God, how that we are all sinners, how that we are all really in and of ourselves unworthy of anything good from God. And yet, when we come to the end of this, He says, "Where is boasting?" There's really no room for boasting. Right. We have no no room for boasting. Yet man still likes to try to boast, doesn't he? When we consider though what we were and what God did for us and what Christ suffered for us and how we are still even if we're saved, we're still lacking in many ways, yet that doesn't leave any room for boasting for the child of God. Right, amen. This boasting means to be proud of oneself or our accomplishments. It's to glorify in oneself. What it does is it turns the attention and glory from God and turns it to man. Mm -hmm. Let's look at me and look what I have done rather than look at God and what he has done. That's what boasting accomplishes. He says, where is boasting then? Is there any, really any room for boasting when it comes to salvation? No. If it were works, we could say, yeah, there's room for boasting. But when we consider it's completely by grace, there is no room for boasting. Uh, so Paul answers his question in the next part of the verse here. He says, it is excluded. Amen. And it's, it's shut out, it's denied access, it's removed, it's prevented from even happening. There is absolutely no grounds for boasting before God. Really, our own sinfulness <laughs> prevents us from having any grounds for boasting. <clears throat> God's mercy doesn't allow for any room for boasting. His grace 
certainly removes any grounds for boasting and his, mm -hmm. <coughs> and his because of his righteousness we also have no no room for boasting but because God is the one who has worked out our salvation from the beginning to end we really have no leg to stand on if you will we have nothing to say look at me look what I have done Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, I think we all know that scripture. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God. Amen. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen. <clears throat> well, if it were of works, man would boast, wouldn't he? Man would say, look at these things that I have. To, look at this that I have to offer you, God. Or, mm -hmm. Without getting too ahead of ourselves, that's exactly what the Pharisees did, though. Mm -hmm. If we're not careful, we'll do the same thing today. And there are many, many today that are trusting in their good works and trusting that they're going to you know, be a good enough person or they're, when they stand before God, their good works are going to outweigh their bad works. And, mm -hmm. so that type of salvation leaves room for boasting. You're right. Amen. We says it is completely excluded. That is, there's no room for boasting before God. Right. Really, if we consider how great God is and how little we are, we would see that we have no room to boast. You're right. Yeah. We, we consider just how marvelous and how righteous and holy is, He is and how sinful and wicked we were and Really how fall how far we fall short still today we would have no room for boasting. Amen. Well, he says, where is boasting in it is excluded by what law of works? Is there any law or rule that <laughs> excludes boasting? No keeping commandments and rules and laws that allows for boasting, doesn't it? Right. Especially when you trust in that for salvation, or that you or trust in that that you're a good person, that you have kept the laws, therefore you must be right before God. That allows for boasting, but yet in the salvation of God there's still no room for boasting. Amen. Uh, I think about when I was growing up, I was a you know, pretty good kid. I didn't get in trouble much. I followed the rules in school. You know, in my flesh, I could say, yeah, look at me and how good I was. But yeah, when it comes to salvation, there's no room to say, look at me and how good I am. <clears throat> As we mentioned in Ephesians 2 there, if it were of works, man would boast. Mm -hmm. Why he says, not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen. You know, the law of Moses was in many ways a law of works, wasn't it? Now, that wasn't what saved them, but by the time Christ came along, that's how they had used the law, that they must keep it, and that, they, that made them a better person. But even Paul said before he was saved, he could boast in the fact that he was touching the law blameless. The Pharisees, they put a lot of stock in the things that they did and didn't do right but when you come before god none of that will matter we'll turn over to exodus for just one moment here exodus chapter 19 right after shortly after they were delivered from egypt and right before god gives them the first part of the law what we call the ten commandments exodus 19 verses 5 and First part of six. This is the word of the Lord to, that he is giving to Moses to speak to Israel. And he says, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my commandment, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Amen. He, this first covenant here was that 
if you'll do this, then I will do that. Mm -hmm. You know, that type of that type of covenant, you have room to boast, don't you? If you say, well, I've kept my part, I've done this. Mm -hmm. we, we see very shortly that Israelites weren't able to keep that covenant. Right. Mm -hmm. And if our salvation were conditioned upon what we did or didn't do, we wouldn't be able to keep it either. All right. Thanks be to God that he extends grace to us. If we turn over to uh, Luke chapter 18, we'll see exactly how the Jews and especially the Pharisees thought. I know we're all familiar with this passage of scripture. We have two that went up to pray, one a Pharisee and one a publican. Luke 18, verse 11 and 12 here, describing the Pharisees, it says, The Pharisees stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even as is publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. Hey, this Pope, this uh, Pharisee here, he was boasting about all that he was and all that right. he wasn't. All that he did and didn't do. Yet, in the presence of God, we have no such place for boasting. <laughs> and really, if we, if he understood the scriptures right, he would have known there was no room for boasting. Because that's exactly the way the Pharisees went, and that's exactly the way many modern, quote, Christians go today, is that it's all about what they are doing and not doing. Oh, you have, well, on the other hand, you have people who just don't want to, who don't do anything in the service of God, proclaim that they're born again. And, mm -hmm. You have on the other extreme people who seem very moral, and yet that's what they're trusting in for salvation. Right. So if we would really come with the right understanding of God, we would see that there is nothing in and of ourselves that we can do to earn His grace or to obtain salvation. We simply present ourselves before him as unworthy and vile and plead for his mercy and his grace. You know, Paul says back in our text, by what law of works, he says nay. There's no work. Do not exclude boasting, rather works promote boasting, don't they? Right. No. <laughs> Yet there are or many today that for some reason, despite what Scripture clearly explains, trust in these works. Well, he says, but by the law of faith. Which is, faith leaves no room for boasting, does it? Amen. <laughs> it leaves no room for arrogance or self-pride or any of those type of things. Because real biblical faith means that we have to to simply throw ourselves upon God and His mercy. You know, there might be some that say, well, I believe, so that was my doing. You know, you can't believe unless God gives you faith. All men have not faith, is what Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians 3, 2, so you can be sure that faith is a gift of God. Amen. Yes, we must believe that is command. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. But you can be sure no one has believed unless they have received faith from God. Amen. That is really what Ephesians 2, 2 and 8 is saying. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not ourselves is the gift of God. If God grants us faith and we can believe, and He saves us through that faith. I like said faith must admit that there is nothing that we can do. And we must simply fully trust in what Christ has done for us. That is what real saving faith is. You know, there are other types of faith in this world. Faith that when people put their faith in the government, what the government's going to do. You know, some people put their faith in things and material possessions. And when in another sense we have, have faith that I'm going to go out there and my truck's going to start and I'm going to drive home after church. But that's not saving faith. Right. 
but we must look to God for salvation. That is saving faith. Isaiah 45, let's turn there for a moment. Isaiah 45 and verse 22. Isaiah 45, 22 says, Look unto me, and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. Amen. Yeah, that is faith. Look unto God, and be saved. Not look at yourself, not look even at the church, or the preacher, or the, the pope, or whoever it is. Right. Just look unto God. He's the only one that can save. Take note of that last part of the verse, for I am God, and there is none else. That will be important here in the next couple of verses. No faith excludes any boasting. The fact that we are saved by grace leaves no room for us to, to brag or to have pride in ourselves. Rather, the fact that we were guilty and wicked and sinful before God, yet in His goodness He chose to bestow mercy and grace, send Christ to die for us. If you consider all that, there's Zero room for boasting. Right. Amen. Let us not be proud of anything that we are. Let us think, thanks be to God that by the grace of God I am what I am. Amen. Yeah. On verse 28, back on the text here. After considering that, that there is no room for boasting, he says, therefore, we conclude. This is really the only conclusion that one can arrive at after we've seen all this in the previous verses. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Amen. We are justified, we are declared innocent, made right with God, so that by faith without the deeds of the law. It is, it's only through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not by any deeds that we do. The Jews, they trusted him, keeping the law. We get that is not what justified them before God. There are no amount of works they could ever earn that justification Amen. before God. Paul came to the same conclusion back in verse 20 when he was, after he told us how wicked man is and how sinful man is and how we're guilty before God. Based upon that, he came to the same conclusion. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, but by the law's knowledge of sin. Mm -hmm. And here again, we see, based upon what God has done for us in salvation, there is, once again, we are justified by faith without the deeds of the law. But it seems like it ought to be clear, and I think we all understand that, but if the natural man cannot understand that for some reason. Right because he cannot understand the things of God, but the carnal mind still defaults to having to do enough good works to earn favor with God. Right. And that is the basis of many, if not all, false religions in this world, that you have to do something to earn favor with God, that you have to be a good enough person or do these certain things, and then you can have salvation. You see it even in Roman and Greek mythology, they did certain things to appease the gods. Mm -hmm. Even in Islam, they had to do certain things to obtain their version of salvation. In many quote denominations of Christianity, you have to do certain things or not do certain things. Right. You have to be a part of the right type of church or in the Catholic religion, you have to be a Catholic and you go through all the sacraments and follow all their traditions, or otherwise you will not receive salvation. And yet, we see very clearly here that it is not by any deeds that we do, but simply by faith that we are justified. Amen. The reformers, they weren't right in their intention, I don't think, but if they did get a few things right, and they realized that the Catholic Church had 
salvation and justification all messed up. Right. Luther once said, if you get justification right, then you can get the rest of it right. Something along those lines that we are justified by faith and faith alone was their stance. Mm -hmm. and that's been the stance of God's people the whole time. All right. We don't need to add anything to it, nor should we take anything away from it. But Paul preached the same message to the Jews back in Acts chapter 13. Let's turn there and read that. <laughs> Acts chapter 13, he had just quoted David in the Psalms about the Holy One not seeing corruption and not like David saw corruption, but yet Christ was raised and did not see corruption. Pick up in verse number 38 here. Acts 13, 38, 39, it says, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, as is Christ, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. Amen. And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. And the law could not justify us in the sight of God. Amen. It could cover your sins for a time, but it could never make us just in the sight of God. That's why the Old Testament saints went to what we call paradise or Abraham's bosom. And right. when Christ came and he made the sacrifice, then they could be fully justified in the sight of God. Mm -hmm. That's why today we can say to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Mm -hmm. Because Christ has made that sacrifice for us through faith in Him, we can be justified in the sight of God. So you can be sure in, by the deeds of the law or by good works or any of these other methods, you cannot be justified before God. We don't have to turn there, but Paul repeats the same thing in Galatians several times. Galatians 2.16 Galatians 3.11 and Galatians 3.24 tells us very plainly that justification comes by faith in Jesus Christ and not by the deeds of the law. Amen. Let's go back to our text in Romans and we'll continue on here. You now we kind of turn our attention a little bit to make sure that all are included. Verse 29 says, Is he the God of the Jews only? Jehovah God. He is certainly the God of the Jews, but he is not just the God of the Jews. Amen. It was not that he was the God of Israel and then the other nations had their own God, even though they made up their own gods. They worshiped their own gods. The Romans had all their different gods. The Greeks had all their different gods. Those in Asia, they have all their gods. But yet, the God of the Bible, Jehovah, as he's called, he really is the God of all gods. Isn't he? Amen. He is not just the God of Jews only. It says here in the next, is he not also of Gentiles? Whether they recognized him as God or not, whether they worshiped him as God or not, he was still their God. Amen. And he says, yes, of Gentiles also. Our God, he is the God of all the world, of all of creation. Jeremiah 3.27 says that he is the God of all flesh. Acts 10.36 says he is the Lord of all. Amen. Psalms 24.1 tells us that the whole earth belongs to the Lord. All that is therein, the world also, and all the people therein. So all the world, all of the earth, all of creation belongs to the, to the Lord God Jehovah. Amen. And whether man wants to recognize him as God or not, he is their God. Mm -hmm. They will stand before him one day. And even though it will be too late, they will recognize him then as God. Amen. Yes, he is both the God of the Jews and also the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. The Jews could not say, well, we've kept the law, or we have Abraham as our father, and the Gentiles couldn't say, well, we did our best, and we had all this wisdom and knowledge, that was primarily what the Gentiles saw after. Mm -hmm. 
no matter what your background is, you cannot claim any of that. You must say it is of Christ and what Christ has done. Amen. Yes, he is the God of all, verse 30. He continues on the same thought. He says, seeing it is one God, there is only one God overall. So we could turn and look at several places, but let's look at Isaiah 46. We recall what we read in Isaiah just a few minutes ago that he said, Be ye saved. Or be looking to me and be ye saved all ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. Amen. That same thought is carried out here that he is God and there is none else. Isaiah 46, verses 9 through 11. Here it says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Amen. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, and saying, My counsel shall stand, I will do all my pleasure. Calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executes my counsel from a far country, yea, I have spoken it, I will also bring it to pass, I have purposed it, I will also do it. Amen. Yeah, that is the God of the Bible. That is Here we go. Jehovah God, that he is God, there is none of us. He is God alone. Psalms 86, verse 10 says that in another place it says that he will not give his glory unto another. No, there is none even like unto him. Man has made up all these other types of gods, worshiped all these false gods, and yet none are like unto Jehovah God. Amen. Without getting off on a rabbit trail, we see very clearly his his omniscience and his sovereignty here in these verses. He knows all things from, from the beginning to the end. So they declared them even from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, I will do all my pleasure. And the last part of 11, he says, I will, I've spoken it and I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it and I will do it. You can be sure if it's, God has spoken and he will do it. Amen. So he has purposed it. No man can thwart his plan. Amen. That he will do according to his pleasure and his counsel shall stand. <laughs> that is the God of the Bible. Whether Amen. Man wants to accept it or not, he is their God. And that he is not just some helpless person sitting up there wringing his hands hoping he'll do what he wants or Hopefully you'll live in your heart, or hmm. that he's just the old man upstairs as many portray him. Hmm. No, he is the one who declared to all things from beginning to the end. Amen. Declared his purpose and it will come to pass. And I would say not only in spite of wicked men, but also sometimes by means of it. That he does as he pleases with whom he pleases with hey, whom he pleases. You can be sure he, verse 11 of Lewis said, Elijah there calling a ravenous bird from the east. If God is able to use whatever he will for, for his purpose, he used a, a raven to feed Elijah. He used a whale to swallow up him. He, Amen. He uses all these things to, to accomplish his will and purpose. And who are we to question him? But that is the God of the Bible. That is the one true God overall. And whether man accepts him or not, he still is the one God. We'll turn over to Deuteronomy real quick and then we'll go back to our text again. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Number 39, Deuteronomy 4, 39. It says, Know therefore this day and consider it in thy heart that the Lord is Jehovah, he is God Amen. in heaven above and upon the earth beneath. There is none else. He, he, he is God, not just in heaven, but also on earth. Mm -hmm. So many today, even professing Christians, would like to. Just think of him as God in heaven, but yet he is 
still very much God on earth as well. He is still very much in control of this world despite what may be going on around us. He is not alarmed or worried about what the wicked are doing. Amen. As we saw in Isaiah there, he is bringing about his purpose. But he is God both of heaven and of earth, and, he, and there is none else besides him. We can be sure that Satan has not dethroned him, or Satan has not Amen. overtaken his sovereignty or anything foolishness such as that. Yes, you know, Satan is powerful and Satan is working according to his own purpose, but yet God is ultimately going to accomplish his purpose. And one day he'll get the glory even out of that cast that old serpent in the lake of fire. Amen. Let's go back to our text here in Romans. We'll try to bring this to a close here. Romans 3, verse 30. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. Amen. That is the Old Testament saints or the Jews, the circumcision, and us, the Gentiles, the uncircumcision. That they were saved by looking forward to Christ coming. They were, they had faith in the coming Savior, Messiah, as they call him. Just the same as we're saved by looking back at what Christ has done for us. It's the same God that saves both the Old Testament saints and the New Testament saints. It's the same God which saved them by faith that will save us through faith. Amen. When Peter had that discussion in the book of Acts, I didn't write this down in the notes, but he's saying they will be talking about the Gentiles. He says, we are persuaded they will be saved by faith just as we are. Mm -hmm. We'll see as we get to chapter 4 that yes, even the Old Testament saints were saved by faith. Abraham and David are the examples used there. We see it also in the life of Job. Let's turn there to Job chapter 19. You see a very clear declaration of his faith. Mm -hmm. Certainly Job was a a good man, a perfect man, as he's called there. Doeth good and skewed evil. Job lived an upright life. But that is not what ultimately saved him. Amen. Job chapter Job chapter 19, verses 25 and 26. Mm -hmm. Here. Job declares, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Amen. Well, there's nothing that tells exactly when Job was written. I know many believe it to be one of the oldest books in the Old Testament, but no matter when it occurred, he knew that his Redeemer liveth, he says. Mm -hmm. Not that just simply that his Redeemer was coming, but his Redeemer would ever live. If Christ would come, if Christ would die and be buried and rise again the third day, that is declared all throughout the Old Testament. You know, the Jews by and large missed it. Yet Job understood that. And he had faith that since even after his body was destroyed by worms, he said, Yet will my flesh will I see God. That one day he would be given a, a glorified body that he might see God in the flesh. And you still have the same hope that Job did, though, don't we? That, Amen. If we, were, if we die and are buried out here, and 200 years from now the Lord returns, certainly our body will be destroyed by corruption and insects and such things, and yet. We can say as Job in my flesh, I shall see God. Amen. Job looked forward to his coming Savior. Just as we look back to our Savior, what he accomplished for us. And we now, we preach the gospel of Christ for salvation. We preach that Christ came, that Christ was buried, and he rose again the third day. 
conquer not only death and hell, but also sin and itself. The fact, I mean, excuse me, Romans 1 tells us that, he said, Paul said he was ready to preach the gospel, for it was the power of God and salvation to everyone that believeth, the Jew first and also to the Greek. So he has some, when we preach the gospel today, we'll see very clearly as we get into the Looking at Abraham and David, the gospel was still present even in the, that day. Just Amen. It wasn't that in the form that Christ has died and rose again, but it was that Christ is coming to pay for sin. Here, the, I'll give you a little uh, spoiler, if you will. The first time the gospel preached to Abraham, I believe, is when he says, In and in thy seed shall all nations be blessed. Amen. It's foreshadowing of Christ coming. Mm -hmm. but seeing that salvation is fully of faith in Christ, we have no room for boasting. We have no room to, for anything but to give God the thanks and the praise and the glory. And we can be sure that it's the same God that we serve here, that they serve in whether it's the Philippines or China or any of these other places, whether we be Jew or Gentile, whether we be, you know, in our day it seems to be American versus non-American. It is the same Lord God Jehovah overall. He will mm -hmm. save though all those who believe. And that is still the command and still the promise we have today. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. The Lord willing, we'll look a little bit next week in the how the law is the role of the law, if you will, today. He says, do we make a void the law through faith? And I'll conclude chapter 3 and then we'll get into what Abraham and David were justified by faith just the same as we were. You might have that thought.